nerd. Stay tuned after his presentation and join me for a live Q&A. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very glad to be here and I'm looking forward to talking with you about social media for the next half hour. Hopefully you are too. And if you're not, that's okay. I'll convince you along the way. Uh, I want to introduce myself again, even though you've already heard the professional introductions, by introducing you to Junior High Steve. Are you ready? I, I, I don't know that I want to introduce everyone to Junior High Steve, but here he is. So you can see I have the same hair challenges as I used to have. Uh, and, uh, you know, we got all kinds of stuff. Now, what am I doing here? I am playing chess as an extra in a movie called The Mighty Pawns. This was filmed in my high school. I was super into chess. I mean, I don't know if you're going to be able to tell that I'm a nerd once I get to the Dungeons and Dragons references later, but that's me playing chess as an extra in a film. And I was super excited by this because Alfonso Ribeiro was in this, which at the time he was the cool kid in the Michael Jackson Pepsi commercials, but now you just sort of think of him as Carlton, right? Anyway, at the time we thought this was super cool. This was gonna make chess cool. Well, you see how that worked out, but still, I was super excited. And look at the focus. I mean, I just think that this is as a piece of acting. I'm not going to show you the video. I just I think the still frame is enough to get you the idea. But of course, one of the elements of this film and the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm spending time talking about my chess, my checkered chess history in junior high with you is this scene in the movie, which uh, they meet a chess player at the park. And it just turns out that they win over and over and over again. And it turns out they, they're just so excited that they're so good at chess and that he's not. And of course, this is the scene where he gets out his wallet and says, let's make it interesting. And you know what happens next. He goes into his mom's house and he grabs all the money and well, then he loses it. And it turns out he was hustled in the park. So why are we talking about chess hustling at the beginning of Facebook? Because in some ways, I think the history of social media over the past three or four years has been, sorry to say, a hustle. You do it for a while, you get some results. All of a sudden, all the things that you did for free that you know, got views, got likes, got shares, nothing, or a lot less. It turns out that we are, ladies and gentlemen, in the midst of a bit of a social media hustle. And my job is to help you get through that hustle so that you don't end up like Carlton here, uh, going into your mom's uh, you know, or your mother-in-law's uh, house and grabbing all the money. So let's talk about how we're gonna manage this in the next, uh, in the next couple minutes by talking about this fat caterpillar. And this bag over here, uh, and this is a Dungeons and Dragons thing. I'm sorry, we're going to do Dungeons and Dragons. I know you're thinking, nerd alert, it's not going to be okay, but it's going to be okay. And that's a bag of holding. And just wait and see. There's a reason why we're talking about it in the self-storage uh, industry. But let's talk about this caterpillar first. And apologies to Eric Carl for uh, grabbing the very hungry caterpillar. But we're going to introduce ourselves to the very hungry Facebook. So Facebook uh, is pretty old by now. In its whole life, it's been hungry everything all around it was full of all these other things that it wanted to eat. And just like a fuzzy caterpillar, it couldn't stop. It turns out Facebook uh, ate all these companies, all of them, just so hungry, just ate all of them over the years. And there they are, and it consumed them. But you know what? The thing was, Facebook was still hungry. You think it should be finished, but it's not. The next thing Facebook saw was an election. And there were a lot of people after the 2016 election who blamed Facebook for misinformation and chaos involved in that election. And because of this conflict with the election and the fear in the public that maybe Facebook had eaten the election, all of a sudden there was a reckoning. Facebook went away for a bit. I mean, it didn't but it reorganized itself as it mutated and pupated into something else. And you can see, as Mark Zuckerberg wrote right before Facebook changed what it did, recently we've gotten feedback from our community that public content, posts from businesses, brands, and media is crowding out the personal moments that lead us to connect more with each other. This moment happened, and what was to follow was known as Facebook Zero or the Facebook Apocalypse. And this is the time when Facebook changed all the algorithms. Um, to prioritize your personal friends and family and to deprioritize the posts of anyone else, news organizations, corporations, nonprofits, educational institutions, you pick it. If you weren't a friend and family, all of a sudden your reach plummeted. 
Some social media gurus like Neil Patel argued that after January 2018, your organic reach on social media is virtually worthless. In other words, all of a sudden, the things that used to work didn't work anymore. And this was played, of course, as a nice piece of public relations responding to the criticism over the election. But it's hard not to think that this was the plan all along. So let's talk about what happens here. So first, we lose all of our organic reach at Facebook Zero. All of a sudden, and what organic reach is, are people who follow you naturally, who just happen to see your posts in their stream, often because they've liked your stuff before, they've interacted with it in different kinds of ways, and so it will the algorithms will show them your posts. That stopped happening, and that organic reach largely evaporated for folks. And I, I've, I've talked to people whose, whose reach after 2018 was cut in half by three quarters, in some cases, almost for nothing, like nine tenths of a reduction in their reach. So if you found your reach after January 2018 not plummeting so much, that's a good thing. But for everybody, it got a lot less. And so what ends up happening is this business of the rote also gets a thumbs down. What I mean by rote is the kind of posting constantly, because we think that's what we're supposed to do. We read an article by Guy Kawasaki in 2009 that said you should post to Twitter eight times a day. Make sure you're posting every day. Somebody like me at a conference like this said you've got to be posting every day or every other afternoon. And you're thinking, well, I'm running a business. Um, when am I going to do that? I guess I'll grab a millennial or a Gen Z person that I can find around and be like, you like this stuff? Go ahead and do it. Sure, just post some things. Those kinds of posts all of a sudden stop mattering. Because the thesis behind those posts is if you post every day, you post every hour, it will throw itself organically into people's streams and they will see your material uh, whether they want to or not, simply by volume, by rote, by performing the same, maybe underwhelming, kind of boring, whatever sort of posts over and over and over again, that somehow that's going to lead people to magically discover your content. And before January 2018, that might have been true. After January 2018, it wasn't. Now, again, Facebook Zero was allegedly about recovering the national conversation after a contentious election. But in many ways, what ends up happening to a lot of folks is Facebook does a massive upgrade to their pages manager and to a lot of their other commercial features. And it turns out that like the hustler in the park, now they want you to buy ads. And if you want to have reach, you have to buy reach. That's difficult. That's expensive. And as a business owner, you wonder, what's the ROI on this? How do I know right, whether or not I should make that investment or not? Since it was so easy before and now it's difficult, how do I know that throwing money at this is going to pay off, especially compared to all of the other opportunities that I have? Well, that's what we're going to try to work with. So if we think about rote posting, the stuff that stopped working, let's just make sure we know what we're talking about so that we can look at what's the bad before we get onto the good. So when we're talking about rote stuff, we're talking about all these things, link shares, basic business, polls, giveaway, memes, holidays. Let's define a few of these. Link shares are kind of just you have a blog as a company or you're just sharing other blogs in the industry or other blogs that are related to something that might conceivably can be connected with storage. Basic business, like we have a sale, we have a vacancy, uh, simple announcements about that kind of stuff, polls and giveaways and then memes and holidays, forget it. So these are the things that just no longer work. It used to be these were the filler we would do because we didn't have any better ideas. I don't have a better idea. Let's celebrate Arbor Day. I'm not sure what's going on. Let's give away whatever. Uh, and these things used to work, but they don't anymore. But you still see people doing them as if, you know, they didn't get the memo. Well, here's the memo. So it, as I was preparing this, uh, in the last week of September, I decided to sort of like just search for some self-storage posts that I could find online close to me. And so Facebook gave me this from a local, um, a local self-storage place. And what I found is that the first 10 posts were exactly all on this list. Not entirely surprising, but kind of depressing. Apparently there's a National Dogs and Politics Day. So this is both a link share and a holiday. Although, is that a holiday? Like, does that count as a holiday? Like, how do you celebrate National Dogs and Politics Day? You know, is it like you just everybody looks at the picture of the dog smoking cigars and playing cards, that old painting. I, I mean, I don't even know what that is. Uh, there's a Halloween sort of thing, you know. OK, and then we've got this. We've got a, I mean, OK, the pug thing is all right. But I mean, memes are kind of over, you know, I don't know. I mean, they're still there, but not this way. And then uh, we've got a share of a, hey, can you recognize this song with 
no indication of what the song is because the link isn't done right. And of course, both of these posts are blurry and pixelated because somebody was just kind of literally phoning it in and just posting this stuff. And this stuff doesn't work. And it turns out that this place who I've, I've removed their name for safety uh, and, you know, because they did consent to being, uh, you know, eviscerated by me at the national conference. But, um, you know, as you can see, there's zero likes, zero shares, zero comments, no connection. No, it's like as if you're shouting into the void and hoping for the best. And it just isn't. And then the question is, well, maybe we should just stop posting entirely. Right. If it's not going to work, Steve, if what you're telling us is that no matter what we do, we're not going to get reach anymore. Then why should we bother? And that's where we get into trouble because an empty Facebook page with nothing on it also communicates something about your connectedness with the rest of the social media environment, that your connectedness with the community. And honestly, uh, across different industries, an empty Facebook page with very little on it or that hasn't been updated since 2016 feels creepy to people. It feels sketchy. Like if this was a real business, they'd post sometimes. So how do we pivot on this? The idea is that we don't have to post all the time, but we can't post never. And we have to post smarter instead of working harder to post more and more often. So let's figure out what that means. So to do that, we're going to leave this very hungry caterpillar behind. We're not going to let him turn into a butterfly because we don't want Facebook to turn into a butterfly on our account. We want to be the butterflies, I think. I guess my metaphor is breaking down. So let's move on to this bag over there on the side. What is this bag? This bag is called a bag of holding. For those of you who've never played Dungeons and Dragons, um, and you're like, why are we talking about Dungeons and Dragons? Just hold on a second. What you are is you're hanging out with a bunch of other people in a fictional world, wandering around, fighting goblins and discovering things and gathering things. And it turns out that as you're wandering around this kind of like middle earthy environment and you gather stuff, you need a place to put it. Well, in Dungeons and Dragons, they've invented all sorts of stuff. You get donkeys, you get carts. There's some magic spell that has like a magic hand that follows you around. The bag of holding, though, with the little smile is the best because it's a bag you could put an infinite amount of things into and it never weighs you down and it's always there when you need it. And you can go on about your adventures and never have to worry about the accumulation of things you need to store. Does that not sound on point self-storage, right? The dream of adventurers playing a fantasy game where they're hitting each other with swords, pretend, is to have a magic item that allows them to store all their goods so that they're not encumbered as they go on the adventure of their lives. So our job is to figure out how we can be a part of everybody's life adventure in a little bit different way. So let's unpack this nerdy metaphor a little bit more. Here is the history of interactivity. I could take you through this in detail, but we don't quite have the time for that. So let me just give you some of the highlights, especially if this text is a little bit too small. For the last 45 years, and Dungeons and Dragons was invented in the late 60s and became a thing uh, officially in the early 70s. Since all that time, the history of our technology, our culture, our business environment, everything has really been about increasing interactivity over time. From the internet and its beginnings back in the 70s, from play to being fans of popular culture to everything from like mythology to leadership studies has been more and more about this kind of interactive moment between how can we sort of connect and how stop having a kind of broadcast model, but an interactive model of everything in life. And so if that's true, what does that mean for us? If we simplify this, I would argue that in the 70s and 80s is when we first begin to develop these connections. We first invent Dungeons and Dragons. We invent the internet. We begin to sort of create cable access, all kinds of early sort of like awkwardness. The tween years and the 80s where we begin to generate sort of networks, we begin to build the architecture that what happened in the YA years in the 90s and early 2000s, where we build the internet, we build the internet 2.0, we build social media and interactivity. And now I would argue that today we're at the cusp of professionalization where the interactive moment is something that all of us can connect with in all sorts of ways, so much so that we begin to create kind of norms and sort of corporate culture in everyday, you know, work-life balance to be able to figure out how it is that we do this as professionals. Uh, so what does that look like for us? Moving on, what we get is all this interactivity is more precisely called an adventure in the Dungeons and Dragons world. And the reason why I want to stick with this adventure term and keep you in the land of Dungeons and Dragons a little bit, just kind of a little bit, is because I like the idea of what adventure does. If I call something interactive, it just means, well, what? You push a button, I push a button, you know, you move the candies over here and then the thing falls. I mean, okay. Interactivity, especially when it connects to telling a story, which if you think about public relations, marketing, advertising, 
all the things we're talking about, your goals for your business. It's all about telling a story. So what is an adventure? What makes Dungeons and Dragons different than watching a movie is that it is a story that is you're taking part in. You're playing a role. It's interactive. That's the first bit there. Second, you're playing a role. You get to star in it. Just like the Choose Your Own Adventure books back in the day, all of you Gen Xers will remember, where you got to move around through the thing and find the page and, oh, I died and I have to go back. That's Bandersnatch for those of you uh, who never had that back in the day and if you saw that on Netflix but you're all part of the story which is so much better than watching a bunch of hobbits and you know warriors running around and the last part and the hardest part for us is that you be able to make meaningful choices your choices aren't just do I open the toaster or do I not open the toaster but in an adventure story you get to make a choice that changes the arc of the story you're not just there watching everybody else do the cool stuff while you take a picture from the sidelines. You're a part of the story. It's my contention that over the last 45 years, we've gotten used to, as people, being a part of the story, being a star of the story. Just look at selfie culture on through Instagram influencers. And as such, to connect your public relations, marketing, and advertising story with people, you've got to find a way to invite them into that story so that they can write their role in that story and tell your story in a different way. Okay, easier said than done. Let's see what that looks like. So here's Dungeons and Dragons for you. And these are all the different inferior bags, right? That you could take with you, you know? And one of those guys is lugging around a chest. I mean, forget it. How are you gonna even take that, you know, into a dungeon? There's all these bags and then the magical bag of holding, which is so much better. Right. Uh, and so we're going to fill this bag of holding with all the stuff that helps tell your story and think about how important it is to help people make meaningful choices. Arguably, if I'm on an adventure with a bag of holding, I can make more meaningful choices because I don't have to worry about the other stuff. You could spend more time having fun. So what does this look like in terms of social media to make a kind of strategic level decision about, all right, I want to tell an adventure, even if it feels like adventure, this is such a nerdy metaphor, Steve, I don't know how it relates to my, my business. We're getting back to there, right? But if you have the idea in hand that what we want is a story that people can see themselves in, just like they can see their stuff in your facility, then what that means is we're doing these two things. We're making destination pages and ad worthy posts. Let's talk about what these are. A destination page is a reaction to Facebook zero. In other words, you can no longer guarantee that people will see you organically in their feed. And if you're not buying ads, that's especially true. So what do you do with your Facebook when you're afraid people aren't gonna see it? What I call a destination page is a space that's carefully curated. Instead of posting all the time, because you once were told that in a seminar back in 2012, post smart post more interesting stuff, what we call in the world of blogging, evergreen content, except in your social media. So that maybe you post once a week, once a month. I'm not sure what your timeline is. You all have different resource constraints on your ability to do these kinds of things. But when I look at it, even if the material is a month or three weeks old, I look at it and go, well, that's still interesting to me because that post is interesting to me and it's worth me going to check it out. Here's the gold standard for social media after Facebook zero. If I happen to search out your page and find it, maybe I'm a customer just moved into the city or moving out of the city and I've never used storage before, but I'm all of a sudden just looking. When I find your page, I stay there and I scroll. What I see as the first post that I find at the top of the feed is so interesting that I'm willing and interested to make an action to expose myself to more of your marketing content because I like it that much. That's the gold standard of what a destination page would look like. And it's not as hard to achieve as it might seem. The second part then is related. Make ad worthy posts. What this means is that every post not only should serve as a fantastic destination, but that you would be willing to pay to share that post right? As an ad on Facebook, that you would boost that post. Not saying that you would boost the post. You may decide that boosting Facebook posts is not a correct use of your marketing and advertising dollars, uh, but you might. But in either way, every post should be good enough to share. That way, if it does get attention and people are liking it and, you know, commenting on it, that's a way better ad to share that already has the social proof of other people interacting with it. So every post should be kind of as good as it can be by itself. And that all those posts together should create a kind of a destination 
so that if you do decide to make an ad, you already have content for an ad. You already know what it is. And when I click on that ad, I will end up in a destination full of similar content, good quality, interesting, fun to interact with. Okay, great. Now, how do we actually make that content? These are the key things. I've been researching this for a long time. And uh, these are the things that tend to get the kind of destination, ad-worthy, interactive sort of moments from people. If you think about interactivity in this case, it's, am I willing to share your post? Am I willing to like your post? Am I willing to comment on your post? Uh, what kind of identity has to happen in order to share something? It means I like this. I agree with it. I want other people to associate me with this. That's a lot to ask of somebody. So what are you going to give them in return? How are you going to make them feel? How does your advertising and marketing copy basically fulfill some goal they have for how they want to interact in the world? All of these six things are things that help. Stories, pictures, and videos. You know what those are. Tell a good story. It seems so simple, yet when you look at the world of social media advertising, so many people aren't doing any of those things. In-house data behind the scenes and local stuff requires a bit more of a gloss. In-house data, if you have data that you are willing to share, share publicly. People love data, especially if you can make it into a bit of a graphic and it's unique and it's about you and it's something interesting. Uh, what does counts as that kind of interesting data? It depends, right? You may not want to share certain elements of this kind of data, uh, but if you do have data that you can share, um, that would be interesting to people. Imagine, for example, uh, you know, occupancy rates uh, correlated with seasons over time. And it turns out that most people, what? look for storage and I don't know what month, October, I'm making something up. Uh, that would be interesting to people because it's something unique that they wouldn't know otherwise. You're teaching them something. And we love the, the more you know moment. Behind the scenes, what's it like running the facility? What's in the facility? Uh, what can you share that that tells me something going on that's, that's, that's crazy or unexpected or even just normal? People like normal stuff. Uh, I once consulted with a photocopy company and they wanted to know how to make things more interesting. I said, set up your camera at the end of the photocopier so people can watch the pages go fup, 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 triple their audience. We like weird things. So just give us some of that stuff behind the scenes, stuff that you think is boring because you've been doing it for 40 years. Other people have no idea what happens behind your fences or inside your buildings. And so share what you can that doesn't, you know, violate the privacy of your customers or your employees or whatever. And then last is local. Connect up with local events that are happening. Is your business a pillar of the community? Is your business an important part of the community? Is your business a fringy thing in that old vacant lot on the edge of town? That is not what you want people to think. So connecting with other communities community work as you share other people's posts and interact with the community is important. The local band, football, uh, whatever else is connected with your community and feels important to them, interacting and sharing and being a part of that, you adding yourself to their story helps other people want to add themselves to your story. So if we're going to make interactive posts, people want to connect with them, they want to play a role, they want to make a meaningful choice, and they feel like connecting with your material is meaningful. That's really where we're beginning to figure out the strategy here. What does it take for me to decide that sharing your post is going to be how I engage with it? Here's a picture to think of, think of for a second. This is a line back when we used to have lines and back when we used to all go out without masks. And this is a line of people waiting outside a restaurant called Hop Dottie in Austin, Texas, which, you know, if you're not from Austin, uh, you at least probably have seen Austinites waiting in line. Um, I once uh, was at one of these lines and I asked somebody like, what's this line for? And they literally said, I don't know. But that kind of makes it cooler. We don't want what we need and we don't need what we want. I call this the sizzling mustache principle because I have an enormous presentation about like that goes all the way back to, you know, Tom Selleck and sort of mustaches and a mustache for me is the ultimate and a useless thing on your face. It doesn't keep you warm. It gets in the way when you eat soup or whatever. And there's like a flaming mustache thing anyway, but it, it's now sort of a brand. So I have to keep with it. So deal with it. Right. But it's the sizzling mustache principle. There's an inverse relationship between how much we need something and how much we want something. And I don't need to wait in line, but I want to wait in line. And that's where we're at. So if you think about this, it's not that hard to provoke those things if you can just reach the right moment. So here we have the penguins. You've seen the penguins. Uh, I don't know whether or not this will play for us, but we'll uh, give it our best shot. And I might have just been edited out. Um, 
but this was happening at the beginning of COVID. And of course, if you have penguins, it's much easier to sell, right? Um, if you don't have penguins, it's a little bit harder. And so the penguins would go visit the shed aquarium and they would wander around, or sorry, the shed aquarium penguins would go to the art institute and see everything. And it was sort of fantastic. And people love watching the penguins and people shared it like crazy because it fit into their idea of who they were. I'm quirky. I like cool stuff. These penguins are super cute. It makes me feel good about sharing the penguins. Now you're saying I don't have penguins lying around in storage unit number six or whatever. I get that. So, but what could you do? Here's a couple examples. Over there's a TikTok video. Both of these I've frozen. I have not shown you the video because it's more complicated that way. But this one is just cutting a lock, cutting a lock off a unit. And it's just literally 30 seconds of sparks flying. It's kind of fantastic, actually. The other one is a dude doing karaoke. Uh, and he's actually pretty good. So I left his name in there. Uh, but he just does karaoke because he digs it. And it's like, why not? You know, and it turns out that that karaoke post, he doesn't get a huge amount of traffic, but that has like 10 times more reach than any of his other posts about what's for sale and other kinds of stuff like that. Because we sometimes just like to feel like, hey, you're a human. You like cool stuff, too. You like sparks? You like doing dumb stuff like karaoke? So do we. You're just like us. I feel like I could go to your business not having known you before, never having used storage in my life, always thinking it was the thing that hoarders use when they got too much stuff. And I could show up and I could go, hey, you're normal. This sounds good to me. So let's pull this all together. We've got this big fat caterpillar that's eating our hopes and dreams for free Facebook marketing. And that's a bummer. But we're also this bag of holding who has something unique to offer people uh, to connect with them and tell a story ultimately both in social media and in real life that I can provide a place for you to make your adventures easier. That's a story we can tell. The, the, the story of self-storage is a story of adventure. It's a story of interactivity. You're literally interacting with customers in a way that no other business does. And there's a way for your social media to reflect that ethos by just giving people deep and interesting enough stuff to talk about and to think about. And that's really where we're at. So as we come to a close, I'll just challenge everybody to think about the ways in which you can tell your story more interestingly, more deeply, with more texture, and don't sell all the time or at least don't sell your products all the time. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, whatever social media you're using is way better at marketing and public relations than advertising. You're selling yourself. And if you can't sell yourself, you can't sell your services. Thank you. That was amazing. A lot of great information in there. Very, very insightful. I do have a couple of follow up questions. One of the things that you mentioned was Facebook zero, which could be a newer term for a lot of people. Can you talk a little bit about how that affects self storage owners and what they should be aware of with that? Yeah. So in uh, January 2018, uh, they purposely changed their algorithms to de-emphasize commercial, especially, but also political journalist, nonprofit posts. So in your feed, you're just not going to see that stuff. Even if you like it, even if you want to see it, you're going to see friends and family only as much as possible. And that was a huge change to all their algorithms, which tell your computer, you know, what to show you. And that's true on Instagram as well. And they've changed their algorithm over time, many times, but this was the biggest change ever. They, and they had a sequence of like three or four huge changes within a month. And from the, from December 2017 to February, 2018, the change in what people saw in their feeds was vast and enormous. So basically, unless they're they're paying money to either do a targeted ad or a boosted ad, they're probably not going to show up into other people's feed. Is that the the summary of it? Yeah, in lots of ways. Uh, now there, there's a volume level. If you have, you know, 10,000 followers or whatever, then that's different, you know. But if you don't have those kind of numbers, then you're just all of a sudden, you're going to have a stream of posts that have like no comments, no likes, no nothing. And a lot of people have had that happen, yes. You focus a lot on the Facebook page, but talk to me a little bit about how some of these other platforms are taking over as well. And we can even talk a little bit about video and TikTok and how that's impacting marketing as well. Sure. So because Facebook owns Instagram, it's about the same in both of those places. Twitter is difficult because it's hard to get customers on Twitter. I just feel like there, there's a there's a difference in how people interact on Twitter. And the Twitter algorithm is itself cloaked in sort of mystery. And oftentimes, you know, they have to their business model is ads as well. So any business model that sells ads, or that asks us to make ads to make money is going to 
ultimately make it frustrating and be a bit of a hustle for lack of a better word. So other platforms, Snapchat, TikTok, for example, I mean, those are out there and those are useful, but all of them have algorithms that show you what it is you're going to see. And all of them have to build a model whereby they're either going to have to sell ads or do some magic in order to make money. So Facebook is just sort of the tip of the iceberg in terms of algorithmic manipulation of what's going on. Now, should you be on Snapchat? Should you be on TikTok? Is that where the customers are? Yes and no, but I go on different platforms for different purposes. If I'm looking for a business, I will often look on Facebook. I don't know that I will look for a business on TikTok. So by all means, have some TikTok content if you have great video, but um, I'm not sure that at the decision-making point that that's when people are looking for it. Yeah, I love that you use the word manipulation because I do feel a lot like that in Facebook sometimes. They, they're, they're telling you what you want to know, right? Yeah, exactly. Let's talk a little bit about the destination and the story. Mm -hmm. You mentioned kind of at the beginning of the presentation not to use memes. And I, I find myself sometimes when I go into pages kind of getting into this tunnel of memes and cracking myself up as I'm reading them. So tell me a little bit about how we can make a tunnel without having really funny content like that. And how does how do people sort of content that is engaging in creating that destination like that? Funny is always great. Funny is always preferable. Uh, but your funny is better than somebody else's funny. And, uh, you know, memes can work, but they're often a kind of a placeholder. And that when I go to your page and there's a bunch of memes there, I'll go, OK, somebody here has a sense of humor, but it doesn't necessarily tell your story in a useful way. So I think memes are easy. We can sort of Google them really quickly and just drop them on there. And there's going to be those four or five people who always are looking at our, our stuff for memes. But those four or five people aren't really doing anything with that attention. And we're not doing anything with that attention. But humor that instead pivots around to tell your story. The story of memes is we like some funny, ironic stuff, right? The story of organic humor that's created by your organization is we like some funny, ironic stuff. And this is who we are. And here's how you can connect with us. And here's what we look like. And things like that is what I would say. So memes aren't the worst. You know, they're probably the most effective of the bad things to do. Uh, <laughs> but the ability of memes to just sort of pull people in is shrunk. You have to be in the mood to want to look at a page of memes, I think, in a way that maybe that wasn't the case three or four years ago. Yeah, true. So I actually pulled together a couple of posts from self-storage facilities. Um, some of them are a member, some of them are not. And I wanted to get your feedback on their posts and see what you thought about them. So I'm going to share those now. Okay, great. So on this first batch, these were very basic, informative. I thought it was a great way for them to say what's available, what we offer, a good way to commun communicate with customers. It doesn't have any imagery or any story, but what is your thought on posts like this? So I, I have to say, I'm not a huge fan of these and I, their audience doesn't seem to be a big fan either. I mean, I don't know who this is or how many likes they have as a page so that, you know, so you can't always tell sometimes if you don't have that many, but um, especially the one on the right there with the, the eyeballs and things. I don't know what's happening over there. It's like, let's just create a weird background and, and sort of see. And so to me, this feels like um, this isn't really what a Facebook update or a post should look like. This is doing business and doing regular business is not compelling to people in a sort of Facebook sort of space. And so when I show up at your page and I see, hey, you've got storage available. Well, of course you have storage available. That's your business. And so um, the kind of update stream is to we have availability now, we have availability now, that kind of stuff. There are other spaces in Facebook, say at the top, you know, where you're getting your business information or there's other places where you can give these kinds of updates. Now, if it's a real update, you know, um, then that's going to be something different. And you can tell that story in a different way. And it's much better. Like, let's say you've been book solid for the last year. I don't know. You know all of a sudden you have availability. That would be something to say, you know, I would get on as the storage owner and do a video and be like, we have some availability for once. If you've been looking, it's right here. Look at it. It's empty. That's a way better way to tell that story than this, which I'm just going to gloss over. Yeah. So the next one, I have two posts from two facilities that I thought were very engaging, um, very relevant, especially to the times. Um, so the first one is a, a facility actually nearby my house, and they have this buffalo outside. It's Noah's Art Storage, one of our members. And it was right at the beginning of the coronavirus, and they put a mask on the buffalo. And it was a, a hilarious post, I thought. <laughs> Uh, the second one here, another one of our members, they actually changed the sign up um, and they they have pretty funny things and they post it on there pretty regularly. And I even like that the tag that they put in there is very relevant to the sign itself, kind of lending to that. Yeah. But um, I noticed with, you know, one of them, it's a kind of a, a 
they did this great thing with this coronavirus, but then there wasn't anything else further with the buffalo and it kind of stuck there, but it was still very engaging. And the other one is something that happens more often. So what do you think about these two posts and um, what feedback would you have on them? So I think they're fantastic, but we need to see the buffalo more often. Those penguins, you know, they were showed up all summer and they're still showing up. It's like, where's the penguins going this week? You know, that kind of stuff. And so I would have like, you know, Buffalo Mondays or whatever. You know, and every Monday we're going to see the buffalo is going to be a hat and wearing sunglasses, you know. And if the, that lot, that bottom line of their post is that, you know, if you have photos, tag us. I, I think. We, we should see an owner out there taking a selfie with a buffalo being like, you know, buffalo time and, you know, take your own photos. Come on out. We promise, you know, that, uh, that, that this is great or whatever. That would be more so that you keep it going so that people would be like, hey, I wonder what the buffalo is doing lately. And, and when I ask that question, that's how you get reach without paying for ads is that people are sitting around going, I wonder what the buffalo is doing. Because everybody gets bored, you know, three o'clock in the morning or the afternoon, depending on when you're up that's that's what people want the buffalo now the other stuff is great that's you know having the jokes up there we like the signs um that requires a certain kind of branding identity right that we're going to be the place that has jokes in the sign and that's cool if that's your identity but i can imagine people going that's not who we are we don't want to have a jokey sign and that's okay the great thing about the buffalo is it can show up for social media and be cool and then it goes back to looking like the regular old buffalo out front so as ever other people drive by so that you can control your messaging a little bit um but uh still all both of these i think are really good and you could see how this would continue a story over time and how people would be like hey i wonder what's going on i mean i see people uh, share the el arroyo bits from austin all over the place uh and they're not even interested in that place but it's there so i think these it could easily be the kinds of things that would get shared and maybe be viral yeah, you talked a lot about local stuff, too. I think especially if you live in a small town and you have something to look forward to when you're driving to your commute or whatever it may be, it's something that sticks in your mind and looks forward to. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So the next one is a little bit um, of a different type of post. Uh -huh. This is one of ours. And we talk about humor. This I found it very hilarious. I, I was laughing actually pretty hard at it. But um, our not Tom Cruise look alike. Um, did a promotion for us. And we actually decided to take a boost on this one. And it it had a phenomenal reach. We we're really surprised with it. But what are your thoughts on utilizing video and humorous video at that? I think it's great. And I mean, not everybody has the, you know, <laughs> the ability to hire a Tom Cruise impersonator, right? But I think it's a funny video. And he's, he's kind of eerily on. It's kind of creepy. I'm like, wow, this is this is really good. And, uh, but I mean, there's all sorts of ways people could do this kind of stuff where they're, where they're doing things in, in, uh, um, presenting themselves, especially as a staff, because that's part of the issue with photo and video is I want to know who you are. You know, I want to know, like, so then when I walk in, I know, oh, yeah, you're you're the people I can, I can connect with and, and have, especially in a small town environment, having that kind of connection uh, is, is really good in establishing trust before I get there. But, you know, if, if you were to do your bad Tom Cruise impression, you know, and have your own sunglasses and do it because you know, I think that would be not maybe as effective because this is obviously a lot more, uh, you know, a lot better in some ways, but would also tell something cool. But like, I'm willing to just be out there for it. It's cool. And I think funny is always good. Um, that's how social yeah. media works. And I, I, I run into a lot of folks who are like, I just don't think it's appropriate to do this kind of humor, that kind of humor. Find the humor fits what you think is appropriate and roll with it. I should see something funny if I'm scrolling down your page every couple posts uh, or every post. Yeah. Yeah. So the next one is not one of our members. In fact, it's not even a member from Texas. This is someone from uh, it's a facility from Alaska that posted a video. We'll share the, the video in the, the chat box for everybody to see later. Not right now, but later you can watch it. Um, a bear actually got into the facility It broke into the gate. It kind of crawled underneath the gate and the two facility owners or managers took video of themselves trying to corral the bear and they called the ranger. The ranger came in, they got the bear out safely. <laughs> it was kind of a funny comedic part about how the bear broke into the facility because he forgot his storage code. And then they did this whole promotion following it, which is if you rent a facility, you get a free lock, you know, don't get locked out like the bear did. And I thought they really did a great job. How you mentioned of, you know, being themselves, kind of showing their personality, uh, bringing in some video, bringing in some follow through with the story. So I wanted to see, you know, what did, what do you think about something like this? Well, I think this is right on because this is almost sort of a, a, a next level bit. You know, the coronavirus buffalo um, was cool, you know, but it also doesn't 
it, it, it tells the kind of marketing story, but it doesn't do advertising. This is a great combination of both, you know, as you build this bear story over time, and then you get to that last bit where it's like, okay, here's our promotion and you're using bear puns and you've got the thing connected with it. So that, uh, because I, I know you're a business. So when I go to your Facebook page, I'm like, okay, I'm going to have to look at you doing business. That's what we're here for. Right. Uh, but you're kind of paying the customer back for that attention by here's some cool bear content. And by the way, we also have a special related to it. And I'm like, okay, I can go with that. And it just, it creates a different mood by which when they do see the inevitable promotion, like very specific, buy this, do this, do this, they're in a way better mood for it. And they're like, you've earned my attention. I respect that. I will say too, they did a follow-up post about the security and the perimeter to let their to let your customers know that in the future. But yeah. and again, this was not a Texas facility, so we don't have any bears running around here in Texas. Or we might, not that I know of, but yeah. do definitely get a video of it. But the other interesting thing is this one here on their their next post, kind of through their thread, is they have a common theme: their um, eagle eye store self storage, and so. I don't know if the eagle is their local mascot, but throughout their entire post, they have their people dressed up in these eagle costumes, and then it kind of goes along with their advertising. And I just thought this was a really great way to bring in some humor, bring in some personality. But when you have things like this, does it change um, the view of the facility? Does it make it seem less serious, less um, professional in a way, or does that just kind of lend to the whole environment of Friendliness. What what kind of feedback do you get from this? So I think in, in in a in an industry where you have to have trust, uh, which is most industries, especially in this industry, uh, I need to feel like you're a person who um, is able to behave in all the ways that a person would. And sometimes I think that you know this humor that's not professional is kind of an excuse we tell ourselves because we're not comfortable with humor or we feel like we're not doing it right or things like that. But you know when I'm making when I'm making arrangements of this kind, I want to feel like I can trust you and that you're like a human being and you know what it's like to you know uh, say goodbye to my stuff for a little while and put it in this space. And that humanity comes through humor because that's a part of it. Um, uh, many of the most successful businesses of all time have used like all sorts of humor in their advertising and marketing. And um, but you get the small businesses, and sometimes we think, oh, this is inappropriate all of a sudden. And I think that there's a disconnect between what works and uh, how we often just find an excuse. So I look at this, and this feels super professional to me. It's like, okay, um, here's a tutorial on the gay code, and I feel I feel safe. I feel happy with this. Um, and it's, it's not like you know, ridiculous or demeaning humor. It's just a, it's a, it's a costume and it's kind of fun. Um, so I think this works. And, um, I mean, if this is a local mascot, especially I want to see this Eagle with the local high school Eagle, you know, like arm wrestling or something. I mean, I just want to see that connection with the local thing. It's just, I think it's great. And if it keeps going, I'm like, I wonder what the Eagle's doing. Like those, those terrible Tyrannosaurus costumes that are always bouncing around the internet. You know, you don't have to go for that. In this case, there's a purpose. And I feel like uh, for a lot of people who aren't familiar with, or aren't comfortable with humor, this is kind of, this kind of stuff is an easy way to like, build yourself up towards that kind of stuff. What simple advice or tips do you give for uh, members who post something and they get a negative reaction, whether it be a members just are their their customers didn't agree with them. Somebody posted something, a chat that was inappropriate on the thread or just kind of adverse reactions. What what quick tips can you give our members for managing stuff like that? Okay, sure. So I think there's there's two elements there. One is like, see, people are trolling or just being offensive or being uh, ridiculous or something like that, or self promoting or spamming. So you get those kinds of comments will show up sometimes. And I would just administratively remove them and uh, make it go away, you know. And if people reply to it or people talk about it, I would just have a post straight up to say, you know, we were kind of uh, our Facebook stream had some inappropriate things posted recently. We've removed them. We apologize for it, and um, and then you move on. It happens. Uh, all those kind of things. And then the other way where they're reacting to your business, you know, and they are unhappy with something and they're using your Facebook platform as a way to do that, or they're tagging you in some of those kinds of things. Uh, that's more complicated. And um, I would suggest that, I mean, you can of course remove those sorts of things as well, but, and, you know, uh, so that other people don't necessarily see them, but you're going to have to manage those moments. And if a lot of people that they pick a really, really popular post, like your bear video, and they go there. And so there's lots of people seeing it, simply removing it sometimes isn't the entire option, you know, and sometimes you have to just like if you imagine a public relations crisis and other kinds of 
of industries, sometimes you have, this is your public relations crisis. You have a really loud, vocal, public customer who has issues, and you've got to sort of find a way to sort of manage that publicly um, because they've made it public. So you can't just imagine it's going to go away. So uh, there are the old school public relations is like just shuffle under the rug, delete it, and don't talk about it. And there's a place for that. But being able to say, you know, we've recently got some comments on this page from some unhappy folks. We've reached out to them and we're working with them to find a solution to their issues. And we'd encourage all of you to reach out to us if you have any issues or you have any concerns. We're here. Here's our phone number. Stop by and try to pull people out of the social media part into a one on one customer relationship, which, um, you know, a business owner is, is, is good at. That's our that's where we're from. You know. All great tips. Well, I want to thank you again for this wonderful presentation. I know I walked away with some new ideas and some new techniques that I'm definitely going to try. I hope that our members did too, but thank you so much for joining us today. All right, great. Thanks for having me.